Hey everybody, this is a quick little video to go over the quiz we went through in week five, reviewing some of the basic concepts we have tackled up until then. Um, so I'm going to go over it with you a little bit quickly and then we'll do a little bit of graphing towards the end. So let's go ahead and open up the quiz and take a look. Okay, so here we have the quiz and the first few questions are multiple choice. First, which of the following is not one of the reasons education requires government intervention? And this is tricky because government intervention is required for education for a lot of reasons. It doesn't behave like a perfectly competitive market across a lot of dimensions. Um, it generates positive externalities. It is subject to information asymmetries. There are barriers to entry. There are monopoly effects. Um, there's a lot going on. What's not a problem is negative externality effects. So if we're looking for one of these reasons that's not a reason for government intervention, it's going to be this one, that it uh, generates negative externalities because that is not true. So A. Uh, the next question asks, in the United States, K through 12 education is more likely to be public, private, private but not for profit, or it's impossible to tell. And if you went through K through 12 education in the US, then this is a little bit easier because you're probably familiar with it. But we did talk about this in the class. K through 12 education in the US tends to be public, which means it's publicly funded and not private and not for profit. Which of the following is an example of a resource based education policy? Uh, if you don't remember, resource based education policies are basically looking at shifting out the PPF, right? Just increasing resources generally, not something specific to say an outcome or anything like that. So of these options, incentives for teachers teaching well, uh, access to technology and giving grants for graduating, those are all altering incentives and the production function. Only increasing school budgets is a pure resource-based solution. And then the last multiple choice question, which of the following is an index and not a signal? Remember, both indexes or indices and signals give employers and other agents information, um, but an index is difficult to change, whereas a signal is easy to change. So education, speaking multiple languages, how a person dresses, those are all signals that are very easily changeable. Being tall is an index because you can't change it, but there might be some employers and other actors who believe that there are traits tied to tallness. Okay, um, and then the last question in a sentence or two, explain why we should care about the returns to education and whether they come from human capital or signaling theory. And there's two main reasons here and one we're going to graph. Uh, the first is we care because it's going to have an effect on how we educate and it's going to affect on whether we subsidize education or not. So if it's human capital, we care what we're teaching people because we're making them more productive through what we teach them. Whereas if it's signaling theory, it doesn't matter what a person loves or I'm sorry, learns so long as they get that signal. And then if it's human capital theory, then education makes everybody more successful and it's a positive externality good. Whereas if it's signaling theory, um, then all the returns to education are private and there's not a rationale for government subsidy. So let's go ahead and grab that and we can talk about it a little more. So you always want to remember that with human capital theory, people are getting higher wages with more education because they're more productive. They are learning things that make them more efficient in the marketplace. <clears throat> so that means we care what we're teaching them because what we teach them is what makes them more productive. The other thing is if the workers are becoming more productive through education, there's going to be a positive externality benefit or as the, um, Lobenheim book says a marginal social rate of return. Um, and this is basically a standard positive externality model. So if the signaling model is true, then what you learn doesn't matter. How we produce education doesn't matter. It's just getting the signal across that somebody is high ability or high skill. So in that case, there's no positive externality because there's no benefit to society. All of the benefits accrue privately. So that would be the standard market model. So here's the demand for education and the supply. And if signaling theory prevails, that's it. Demand equals the marginal private rate of return of education. And the market's going to allocate education efficiently because 
the returns will be reflected in the private benefits. If, however, the human capital model prevails, then it's not just the benefits to the individual that accrue through education, but it's also the person learning things that make them more efficient, more productive for society. And then it's not just private benefits. There's a marginal social rate of return, which includes the private. That's that positive externality effect. And that means that the market is going to tend to produce less education than is socially optimal. And so if human capital prevails, there's a rationale for subsidizing education. And we really care how it's produced because we care what people learn because we want that human capital to be functional and to benefit society. So it's a big difference. And that's one of the big points from those two chapters on human capital and signaling theory. That's it. Let me know what questions you have and I'll see you next time.